Welcome back to Reading with Mo. Today we're going to be talking about some of the best books that I read in 2023. Now most of these books did not come out in 2023, although I believe a few of them did. Um, these are just the best, the top, I think I have like 10 or 11 books that I want to share with you guys that I felt like I wanted to mention for 2023. The sad part of my reading for last year was I only gave a five star reading to three books. I really wish I had found more five star books and Potentially some of these books on a reread could become a five star book for me, but as of the first reading of these books, I gave only three of them a five star rating. I'm really hoping that 2024 is better than 2023. I feel like overall while my reading last year was kind of just very in the middle, like I was reading stuff that I liked, but not all the stuff that I really loved or really disliked. So it was very much in the middle. So hopefully I have better luck this year, but let's get into my best books for 2020. These aren't going to be in any particular order, but I will start off with the eight books that I wanted to mention first that I gave a four star rating to. While I'm talking about most of these books, I want to also share the ratings that they have on Goodreads because I feel like that might be something that you guys are interested to know to see if maybe my rating falls in line with the overall rating the book has received. So firstly, we have Clytemnestra by Costanza Casati. I gave it four stars. The average rating on Goodreads is a 4.26. I really enjoyed this book and it's definitely one I would include on being a potential five star reading on a reread. If you like Greek myth retellings, then I feel like this is a book that you would enjoy. This is actually the author's debut novel, which is really awesome that right out of the gate they have released a book that in my opinion is very good and um it looks like a lot of people also feel <laughs> that this book was well written as the title would suggest we are following the story of Clytemnestra who is known as a villain in Greek mythology I don't know how familiar anyone watching this video is going to be or not be with Greek mythology so I don't really want to go too much into her story specifically that way you can enjoy finding it out on your own if you do decide to pick up this book. I read another book at around the same time that also featured this character. I won't mention what book it is now just because I don't want to like sound negative about the other book even though I enjoyed it. It's just I really enjoyed this telling of Clytemnestra. She just felt like such a real character and I just felt like we really got into her head and got to know her through this book and I enjoyed the writing from the author. Stripping it to its bare bones, this is a story of revenge, it's a story of power and strength and overall I really did enjoy this and just talking about it makes me more excited to reread it again. Next up we have Inez of My Soul by Isabel Allende. Something about Isabel's writing just really does it for me so far. I believe this is the third or fourth book I've read by her. She's a Chilean and American author who is definitely known to put include like some magical realism in her novels. This book is a historical fiction. I gave this book a four star rating and the average rating on Goodreads is a 3.98 so pretty spot on with what I gave it. This book was such an epic historical fiction tale and you really similar to Clytemnestra we really just get to know this woman and her story her life story is just so fascinating as it's a historical fiction it's set in 16th century Spain or it's like the beginning of the Spanish conquest of the Americas our main character Inez she is married and her husband kind of just up and off and disappears and it kind of just sets her on this epic life journey that was just so fascinating to read a lot of the events and things that happen in this book are actually set around real life um, figures and people and events that took place in Chile. This book is set during the time of the conquistadors and I haven't really read any books on that subject so all of this was very new to me and I felt like I was able to really get immersed in the story and you definitely feel for as what's happening at the same time is the displacement of a lot of Indian Americans as they're uh, coming over from Spain. It was just um, a very powerful book. I would love to recommend it to you guys. <laughs> and we have a nonfiction book and that is A Darker Wilderness Black Nature Writing from Soil to Stars by Erin Sharkey who is the editor. Each of these essays have a different author. I loved this short story collection. Um, I gave it a four star rating. The average on Goodreads is 4.35. 
Not very many people at all have read or rated or even heard of this book because there's only actually 130, 129 to be specific ratings on on Goodreads. So unfortunately this book hasn't had a very wide audience. So I'm hoping that mentioning it here will help more people to learn and hear about it and be pick it up if they are interested in it. I before I haven't really read a lot of nature writing books, but after reading this essay collection, it's definitely inspired me to want to look out for some more nature writing books I may be interested in picking up. This essay collection is all about writers writing about how nature has affected their life experiences and the role that it's played in the lives of black people in the United States. This was a beautiful anthology that I will look forward to returning to again in the future. I was really close to giving it a five-star rating, but I just feel like I didn't enjoy the last half, like the second half of the book of the essays as much as I enjoyed the first half. Like the first ones were for me personally the ones that I enjoyed and connected with the most more so than the ones that were in the second half. I'm interested to see if I were to reread if I would still feel the same but yeah for now it's a four star rating and a really solidly good piece of nonfiction nature writing. Next up we have The Man Who Lived Underground by Richard Wright. This one has a 3.99 rating on Goodreads and that is pretty spot on with my four star rating. I read previously by Richard Wright, Native Son and Black Boy. They're both books I've enjoyed and I look forward to rereading again in the future. And I'm really glad that I like this book as well. It was published in the 40s and this was an unpublished novel from Richard Wright. In this book, we are following a black man who is picked up by the cops because they're looking for someone of his description um, for a murder and they take him back to their precinct where they put him under so much pressure and interview him and threaten him until he pretty much confesses to the crime even though he did not commit this crime. Through a series of events after he signs his confession he ends up escaping but we don't know if he really escaped or if he was allowed to escape into the sewers of Chicago. The time that he spends in the sewers even just like everything up until that was already really interesting but then he gets into the sewers and things are like weird and different and very surreal but also very entertaining and interesting the things that he explores while he's down there just like mentally as well this book is one of those books that you kind of want to reread again to get more like things out of it that i probably missed the first time so yeah definitely a book i would recommend to you guys Next up we have another nonfiction book and this one is The Time Traveler's Guide to Regency Britain, a handbook for visitors to 1789 to 1830. This is the fourth book in the Time Traveler series by Ian Mortimer and each of them I believe follow a different period of time in Britain through the lens of like a time traveler to help you learn some of the history and backstory and stuff that was going on if you, as if you were to be visiting Britain during that time period. The other books in this series have to do with like Medieval England, Elizabethan England, and Restoration Britain. I gave this a four star rating and on Goodreads the average rating for this is a 4.25. This book had one of my favorite elements of nonfiction that I really look for in the nonfiction books that I'm picking up and that's when an author can write nonfiction as if it's fiction and when I say that I mean that the pacing doesn't feel bogged down. We are getting a lot of facts and information, but not in a way that's just being like listed in a way that's going to be boring or cause your mind to drift or just like not be an entertaining experience. I look for my nonfiction to still have a, some element of entertainment to it as well. Cause I'm still reading, even though I want to be like learning about something that's true. I still want to enjoy my time as I'm doing that. I don't want it to be very cut and dry. And it's just something that some writers can do and some can't in a way to write nonfiction that really breathes life into it is a skill that I very much admire. If you're into Georgian England or Georgian English history at all, I feel like this is a book that would be right up your alley. Uh, this is the first one that I picked up on the subject, but definitely not the last as you'll see uh, another one that is featured later on in this video. I can't wait to get to the other books in the Time Traveler series. I just haven't prioritized it yet just because I have so many other books I'm trying to get to, but eventually I will be purchasing and reading the other ones in this series. Next up we have Happiness Falls by Angie Kim. This one has an average rating of 3.77 
on Goodreads, which I gave a four star rating. So this one probably so far is the one that has the biggest difference from what I've rated versus what's on Goodreads as far as being less than what I've given it. Um, I've read previously by Angie Kim uh, Miracle Creek, I believe was the uh, previous book and I enjoyed it and I was definitely open to reading whatever Angie Kim published next and fortunately I really did enjoy this book. I think in the beginning I was thinking it could possibly be a five star read for me but something kind of held me back from getting it and I don't remember why specifically but it was definitely a page turner. I started this book on a flight and I was able to make a pretty good chunk dent into the book because I was definitely invested in finding out what happens. So we're following the story of this family and the father has gone missing. One, uh, we're following the perspective of, I forget her name now. Her name was, Re her name's Mia and she's biracial. They're a Korean American family. The, they live in Virginia. They live kind of like near some woods and stuff. So the father like went for a hike or walk, I believe with like her younger brother who has this super rare genetic condition called Angelman's, Angelman syndrome. So he can't speak or communicate. And he ends up, the, the, her younger brother ends up returning back to the house, but without the father. And that kind of just really sets off the journey of them trying to figure out like what happened to him. Did he, did something bad happen to him? Did he choose to leave on his own? You know, the whole family is wondering what happened to the dad because he would never um, just leave his kid on his own like that. I really loved the writing of this book. There were some parts, I remember like as I was reading it on the plane, like I was take I took a picture of one of the paragraphs that really hit me and I posted it onto my Instagram at the time. There's so many topics and conversations that can be had from issues that this book touches on and brings up that I feel like if you had a book club this would be a good book for that because there's just a lot of stuff that you could really dive into and talk about. Everything from disability to what is happiness, how does someone define that and quantify that and um, if they aren't happy find happiness. So yeah this book was really good and uh, once again as with every book I'm going to be talking about in this video I, m I would recommend it to you guys. I am definitely curious to see what Angie Kim will come up with next. Finally, on to the last four star read before we get into my five star reads is the book, first book in a series actually, and that is The Book That Wouldn't Burn by Mark Lawrence. This one has an average Goodreads rating of 4.13. This book, I definitely am going to have to reread because I remember picking this up and starting it and just really loving the story and the world. So much so, because I was reading it on audiobook, that I got the gist of the story, but I feel like I didn't even fully, fully appreciate the book for what it was, because once I decided that I loved it, uh, and that I seen that it was a series, I was like, well, I already know I'm going to have to reread it before, well, when I go to read the rest of the series, I'm going to have to reread this one, so I kind of, in a way, didn't really want to... I don't know how to even explain what I'm trying to say. This book is going to be part of a trilogy, right? So the third book in the trilogy is not going to be released until, I don't know, it's not even listed on Goodreads yet. So I'm going to assume 2025, which means it'll have been about two to three years before the conclusion to the trilogy comes out by the time I read the first book. But I just know I love the writing. The story was so interesting. And part of me was like, I need to push it out of my mind because I want when I read it physically for it to be like I'm reading it fresh again with fresh eyes and like a guaranteed five star read. I really feel like if I read this book uh, physically when I go to like complete the whole series that I'm going to read it five stars. This book is a blend of science fiction and fantasy. I feel like I'm always so late onto the train when it comes to reading any series or picking up books and series in these genres. Usually I tend to pick them up when they've already kind of had the test of time that there's like a good following and the series is complete for sure and I could binge read the whole series if I do enjoy it. So that's like kind of one thing. I was gonna not even read this book last year because I knew if I enjoyed it I was gonna have to wait years to continue on with the series but I decided to pick it up anyway and part of me kind of wishes I hadn't just because I wanted to wait until the whole series was out but at least now I know I do like enjoy it and so we're following two main characters. One of them 
lives in this kind of like dystopian seeming area, Dust City. Our other main character is this young guy who's been trapped in this massive library his whole life with four other of his siblings. This book has a lot of themes around human society, um, around knowledge and memory. I really enjoyed it and I'm hoping that upon reread that I will love it. So we will now get into the books that I put as my top three books of the year because they're my only five star reads for 2024, ugh, 2023. <laughs> so um, I'll just go ahead and start with the one that I finished most recently and that is the very last book that I finished in the very last hours of 2023 and that is The Strangest Family, The Private Lives of George III, Queen Charlotte and the Hanoverians by Janice Hadlow. I picked this book up when I was in London. Um, I don't even remember. I think I picked this up at like Foils or something it was when I was browsing around that store. I gave it a five star rating, as I've mentioned, and the average rating on Goodreads right now is at a 4.12. This is a nonfiction book, as the title says, all about the Georgian family, but specifically George III. So similar to the Time Traveler's Guide book, this nonfiction book was just told so interestingly. And while it was a very long book, specifically like 600 something pages, um, and I had to sit there and physically read it all with my eyeballs because I could not find um, an audiobook anywhere that was available to me in the United States for some reason. So I took, it took me a little bit longer than I expected to read this book just because I had a lot of other stuff going on. And with nonfiction, it's not like something, at least for me, that I've ever been able to binge. It's like with nonfiction, I can get maybe 30 to 50 pages at most in, in one reading session. And then I'm like, okay, that's enough reading for now. <laughs> but I really did enjoy this book. I learned so much about their family. And uh, I think I might've mentioned this in their previous video, but it really left me with the feeling afterwards of like being so glad that I was not born into royalty, that I was never a princess, not that I had any chances of, but that, you know, I wasn't born into those circumstances because while it might seem great on the outside because like you have money and stuff, being a female and being royal, you have like no control hardly over your life. Any scrap of control you have over your life has to be gained with so much cunning and strategy that I would probably just give up and do whatever I had to do because that was just sounds like so much energy. The way the book starts, we start off with the first George and we go through the story of all four of them with the chunk and majority of the book being during the time, during the reign of George III. But even following the story of the other three Georges, each of them are so interesting and each of them could have their own movie. I wish there was more movies and shows about them because their lives were just so fascinating. Even with George III's kids, each of the kids could easily have their own show or movie. Like the stuff that they've gone through specifically, like as far as their romance and their love lives, are so crazy even like I can't even tell you the specific stories now because I don't even want to get into specific specifics with this but the story of the other George's marriages were just like crazy the stuff that happened the things that went down during this time all because for the most part people just were being forced to be in marriages either with people that they didn't love or they were prevented from being in marriages with people that they loved. So it was just crazy. It was a crazy time. And we think back to that time, we probably, a lot of people probably look back at it with kind of like rose colored glasses in that if you were royalty and you had money that you're, you were made and your life was made, but no, they had just the same kind of problems, if not even more so problems that people, at least if you were poor, you could typically <laughs> marry the person that you want. But I feel like it's just so interesting how over time, no matter like what race or time period you were born in or religion or whatever, that a lot of conflicts arise because people don't like who people choose to marry. Like as far as like family or government, it's like, it's such an interesting thing that this has been an issue <laughs> for like all of mankind. It's just very fascinating. Interestingly enough, I had 
three books that were nonfiction that made it into my top books of 2023 and two of them actually were in the top three being five star reads so we can get into the other nonfiction or last nonfiction book I want to mention in this video and that is Troy which is book three in the Greek Stephen Fry's Great Mythology. I have not read the previous two books in the series. I do own them. I just received the other two books sometime last year, but I haven't gotten a chance to read them yet. And with this series, you do not have to read them in any particular order. Uh, the other two in the series are Mythos, the Greek Myths Retold, and Heroes, Mortals and Monsters, Quests and Adventures. There's also a fourth book that's gonna be coming out later on this year but in the series called The Odyssey. The average rating for this is pretty high on Goodreads. It's a 4.35. If you're into Greek mythology nonfiction, then I feel like you will definitely enjoy this book. It, this book tells, as the title says, the story of Troy. So everything from uh, Helen being kidnapped to the Greeks launching the ships, the thousand ships against Troy. Um, how the whole siege lasted for 10 years, all of the war and the casualties that came because of it. If you're anything like me and have no strong background in Greek mythology, I've really only started like reading it and picking it up within the past year or so. Reading a book like this may seem a little bit intimidating, but Stephen Fry has the ability to write and connect all of these big stories and characters in a way that you can get enjoyment out of it. And he even mentions at the beginning of the book, I remember like, you don't have to remember every single side character here. Uh, he is very good at making sure that you can follow along with the story, even if this is your first time being exposed to Greek mythology. So I really appreciated that, especially because yes, this was one of the, f I think this is so far the only nonfiction book that I picked up on Greek mythology. Everything prior to that has just been like modern retellings. So I haven't picked up anything original like the Iliad or the Odyssey. I do have them on my shelves, but I'm not exactly sure when I'm going to be picking those up. So this book I definitely appreciated. And like I mentioned before, I'm looking forward to reading the previous books in the series. So last but certainly not least, we have my final five star read for 2023. And this surprisingly was a young adult book, which might have actually been the only young adult book that I picked up even last year. I can't at this moment recall any other ones. And that is Promise Boys by Nick Brooks. I listened to this one on audiobook and this was such a well done, well performed audiobook that I would highly recommend. Even if you are similar to me and find young adult a little bit hit and miss just because it's just like not a category that you can, uh, or I should say like an age range of books, demographic that you're not in anymore. So it's just not something that I tend to pick up. But I gave it a five star rating. The average rating on Goodreads is 4.04. .04. This is one of those books that I feel like could potentially translate well if it was done well into a movie or TV show adaptation. The book is described as for fans of um, Angie Thomas and Jason Reynolds, who are two authors that I have very much enjoyed in the past. This is a young adult book that falls into the um, genres of kind of like a thriller slash mystery. We're following the story of three high school students, specifically three teenagers of color, who are all boys, who their principal has been murdered. And in order to clear their names, they must now try to investigate and figure out who killed their principal before one of them is um, accused of it pretty much. All of them really kind of have opportunity. They had weapons available. So it's looking pretty bad for them, to be honest. We don't know as we're following their three perspectives, if maybe one of them did it or if it was some other person that we're not even aware of. And that was part of the fun of reading the book was seeing like if we're being lied to by one of these characters or not, if we're maybe potentially one of these POVs is from an unreliable narrator. The audiobook had a full cast, which made it even more enjoyable of a listen. Storytelling was good. Um, all of the characters definitely felt fully fleshed out and real. I enjoyed the writing. All in all, 
if you're into young adult books, definitely pick this up. But if it's something that you kind of like aren't as into, I still would recommend you to pick up. And if you enjoy audiobooks in general, then definitely pick this book up. So those are my three five star books for 2023. There is one more book I actually forgot to mention earlier, so I figured I would just mention it now. And the this book is in a similar vein to the book that wouldn't burn in that it's a book that's the first book in a series, but unlike that one, this one I believe is a completed series. I just picked it up, read it, enjoyed it, and then didn't proceed to buy the other books in the series. So then now I'm at a point where, cause I think I read this earlier, this book I finished a year ago now, it was January 22nd of 2023. I'm at a point where I'm gonna have to reread it to, in order to, I feel like get the most enjoyment out of the rest of the series, but I enjoyed it enough that I don't mind rereading it. And the book I'm talking about is The Blade Itself, which is the birth, first book in the First Law trilogy by Joe Abercrombie. I tried to start reading it around the time that the Catch Up Book Club was picking up this series. And I don't know why I just didn't keep up <laughs> with the series. The book on Goodreads, I gave a four star rating and its average rating is a 4.21. But yeah, this was more of like an honorable mention. I feel like upon reread, we'll see how I feel about it, but I did enjoy it. it it's following a very interesting cast of characters. And this book is, I guess the genre you would probably put this in would be um, epic fantasy, a little bit dark fantasy. We're following these very morally gray characters, but that makes them even more interesting to read from. This was definitely a very character heavy book. Not a lot of plot in my opinion was happening. I'm not sure if that will change as it gets further on into the series, but for now I'm just interested in exploring and seeing where it goes from here. So those were all of my best of books of 2023. Let me know if you guys read and enjoyed any of these books or what your favorite books were from 2023. I would definitely like to know because I'm interested in possibly adding maybe some of them to my TBR for this year. That's it for today. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye!